All right, so back to airway, okay? Um, earlier, as I said, I mentioned we have a s simulation of lungs, okay? This is a hard plastic jar here. It is um, simulating the rib cage. We have a small hole here at the top simulating the trachea. And we have a movable um, diaphragm down here simulating our diaphragm. Now, in a normal function, our diaphragm is like this, relaxed up into our rib cage, right? And our lungs sit on, you know, in the rib cage like that. So we take a breath, our diaphragm contracts down. This obviously contracts significantly more than our diaphragm would, but you know, that's just nature of a and notice how the lungs have inflated. You see the balloon size change? We exhale, the diaphragm relaxes, the internal volume of this container has changed, the lungs go flat, breathe in, the lungs inflate, breathe out, they go flat, all right? So what's going on here is I'm increasing the volume in, in this chamber, by adjusting the diaphragm, right? So diaphragm in this rubber here at the bottom is taking up airspace. I pull the diaphragm down. I've increased the amount of space in here. That means the air pressure, excuse me, the air volume hasn't changed like the amount of air that's in there hasn't changed but the area for it has so therefore the pressure went down because the air within the lungs would have had or within this bottle would have had to have expanded um so therefore pressure went down because that pressure change air is pulled well actually it's pushed i should say because we now have a lower air pressure in here than we do out here air out here is pushing air into there okay but it's a very slow movement um because it's a very minor pressure change we're creating this like state of suction within the chest pulling air in like that now that's normal pressure ventilation i brought this so that you guys don't freak out you can see me uh, do this. This is a sealed NPA designed to go into somebody's nose. It is sterile, okay? Nobody else has ever touched this NPA before. All right, see? So I'm going to insert it into the top of here. There we go. And now I can put this in my mouth and blow on it, and you guys can't, um, don't freak out, all right? So diaphragm isn't moving. You can see that. And it's too freaking small. There we go. All right, that worked. All right, so let me put this where you can see it. Notice I blow in the, they deflate. I mean, they inflate, but they're not deflating on their own. You actually have to have pressure on the chest, you know, the weight of the chest to allow the lungs to deflate. The lungs will rarely passively deflate when the diaphragm hasn't been moved. what I'm doing is I'm putting pressure on the diaphragm here to simulate the weight of the abdomen or whatever putting on pushing on the diaphragm and um, doing that so now you can see I can do this and the lungs air moves in and out or positive pressure also notice how the lungs inflate but they don't become very rigid right they're still very relaxed when I'm using negative pressure.
See how much more pressurized I can get it when I'm doing positive pressure ventilation? This is why positive pressure ventilation can lead to popped lungs, it can lead to pneumothoraxes, it can lead to decreased blood return to the heart. There's a lot of problems that come with positive pressure ventilation. That's why negative pressure ventilation is the desired method if we can help it. Now, you ever gotten a, uh, you, I'm sure you've at one point in time in your life played with some latex balloons and you got some spit or something in there, then that spit started to dry. What did you notice about the balloon when that happened? Is that Molly? If I see Molly come in. Good morning, Molly. All right, what happens to the balloons when they get spit inside of them and then starts to dry? Yeah, the sides of the balloon stick together and you um, have a really hard time inflating them again. They don't, they wouldn't do what this is doing like this, okay? Same thing, yes sir, Chris. You want Molly? She can take the quiz right now. We're, uh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah, she can just go ahead and take the quiz. All right. Um, all right. So if the balloons get wet, they stick together. If our lungs lose the surfactant, and that is often caused by them getting water in the lungs, getting vomit in the lungs, so aspiration, things like that, they lose that surfactant and they start to stick together. Then you're not gonna be able to inflate the lungs as easily. It's gonna take a lot more pressure to get them inflated and they're going to deflate really easy. And so you're gonna use a back pressure system so that when you inflate the lung, you then, see how I'm holding my finger on it to pressurize it, and I'm slowly letting the pressure back out so that it doesn't come rushing out or rushing out and totally deflate the lungs. That's what we would call PEEP. And when we use that with, um, and I showed you the video last week of the um, the lungs on YouTube, the sheep lungs and using PEEP with the ET tube. Same thing here, I'm creating that back pressure by pinching off this airline and not allowing the air to escape, or at least restricting its ability to escape. We will also do this with CPAP. We will uh, put the CPAP mask on the patient's face. It has a constant, that's what it means, continuous positive airway pressure. And we will continue to push air into their lungs and give them that resistance so they don't exhale. But it is positive airway pressure, meaning there's air pushing in while we're trying to push out, while they're trying to exhale. This will reduce their blood return to their heart. This will reduce their preload. This will reduce a lot of different, uh, you know, will result in a lot of different issues. Um, So CPAP is very useful, but it has limitations we need to be aware of. Now, um, also uh, a little side note here, when we have this all sealed and working, watch what happens when I occlude the airway with my finger, all right? We got an airway occlusion. I'm pulling the diaphragm, nothing's happening. There's no movement in the lungs because of the airway occlusion. Now let's say I don't occlude the airway, I just limit it. See how much harder it is? I'm, I'm just partially covering the airway. There's a, there is an airway there, but listen. Hear the airflow, and then I partially cover it. A lot higher it is a higher airflow and um, that's an example of what a partial airway obstruction will do now let's say we have an opening in the chest see how I've taken the plunger out when I go and run the diaphragm now this is an extreme example but the air the lungs are inflating a little bit but 
air is escape entering the lung cavity around it or the chest cavity i mean through my partial opening here this and that is what causes a pneumothorax see how we're only getting one lung to really inflate the other lung isn't inflating very well that's what happens when we get a pneumothorax and we reduce the total lung volume and the total amount of air moving in and out um so those are some examples we'll be playing with or looking at this more in the future um i think these are a really great demo of how our lungs work really good example of that all right so let's go back to talking about cpap So CPAP is that, and you can see what it says here. It's a mask that we put on the face. You're probably familiar with it with our uh, patients using it at home. They wear CPAP on their face when they sleep to try to prevent sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea that helps keep the tongue out of the back of their throat and stuff like that. Some patients who have central sleep apnea actually use what's called BiPAP instead of CPAP. It's um, bi-level inspiratory. Um, our um, continuous positive bi-level continuous positive airway pressure and what it does is it gives a high pressure to inflate the lung and a low pressure to deflate the lung oh, during the deflation and it works almost like a ventilator except for there's no tube into their throat or into their um, trachea so the uh, BiPAP will give them regular breaths but also support their breaths if they're trying to take a breath in we will use this um just like we would have used peep on an et tube to help open the lungs up to and after like aspiration congestive heart failure which would result in the pulmonary edema um a um um drowning sorry um Art, what ARDS is what comes after that um, hardening of the lungs. But anyway, those are some of the examples of where we're going to need to use CPAP. In the pre-hospital environment, our most common application of CPAP is congestive heart failure patients and or MI patients who have sudden pulmonary edema. A lot of edema in their lungs. They sound very wet, and we're trying to force that um, edema out of their lungs. So um, the CPAP helps inflate the lungs, it helps keep them inflated, prevents the alveoli from collapsing, increases the intrapulmonary pressures, allowing oxygen to diffuse into the blood uh, more effectively because it's a higher pressure. Remember, you have a higher pressure of a gas against a liquid, more of that gas will dissolve into the liquid. So that CPAP will allow more oxygen to transfer into the bloodstream. In some ways, it will force the interstitial fluid back into the um, capillaries and out of the alveoli. Mostly what it's gonna do is create a pressure gradient so that it's easier for the interstitial fluid to stay in the vasculature and not exit it. Um, it's, if you can lower the pressure in the capillaries, and that's why we'll give like nitro and stuff to the CHF patient. If you can lower that intra um, pulmonary capillary pressures or the pulmonary, uh, yes, just pulmonary capillary pressure. If you can lower that pressure, you will start to move that uh, fluid back out of the alveoli and into the capillaries, but you've got to lower the capillary pressure. You can't just increase the alveolar pressure. So anyway, um, we well, can use the face mask, you get the big system that straps it around on the back of their head. Um, here. Right. So that's a... Uh, Oh, um.
So pre-hospital CPAP generally is gonna look like some of these designs. We're probably familiar, um, very familiar with a picture like this. Uh, let's see. Why does it have to be the smallest, most useless ever? All right. Um, Yeah, so small. So you can see that's a, a type of device where it uh, fits across the face, straps around the behind the head. Here's a good, another good picture. You can put a nebulizer in line with it. So there's lots of uses. But for your patient to use one of these, they have to have what? What is needed for a patient to have, wear CPAP? Yes, they have to be conscious. They have to be able to follow commands because we don't want to put CPAP on a patient who isn't taking adequate breaths. Could an unconscious patient take adequate breaths? Yeah, you do it every time you fall asleep. But if they're unconscious and not following commands, we don't know if they will be able to respond when we say, hey, take a deeper breath. You need to keep breathing. The conscious patient who is following commands, we can tell them, no, you need to breathe a little more. You're right. Take slower breaths and deeper breaths, that kind of a thing. Those are what we need. We need to see uh, they need to follow that command because if they become apneic or start breathing too shallow, their SpO2 will stay really high because the CPAP is forcing 100% oxygen into their lungs, but they won't be exhaling the CO2, they won't be ventilating properly, and so they will become acidotic. And so we, we've got to keep um, them breathing and exhaling that CO2. Generally, if their SpO2 is above 90%, there's no, uh, there isn't a lot of use for CPAP. Um, we'll, we'll, CPAP is one of those things, once we initiate it, we should not dis, uh, disconnect it. We should not remove it. Some protocols will allow you to remove it uh, long enough to put another sublingual nitro on, under their tongue or whatever. But in general, the recommendation is once CPAP is initiated, you do not want to remove it because you lose that pressure differential and you and lungs start to collapse or fill with fluid again, and then you have to start it all over. Um, and it's gonna take a while for them to get comfortable with it again. So once it's established, we really wanna leave it there. Um, so patients breathing too fast, patients, uh, but they still have to breathe, or they still are breathing spontaneously, patients who have a low SpO2, and I recommend that you're using it for patients with wet lungs. Rails and ronchi are what's gonna benefit from CPAP. Most of your COPD and asthma patients, while they might be able to use the CPAP, they tend to not tolerate it because the issue with COPD and asthma is how much effort it takes for them to exhale, not how much effort it takes for them to inhale or keep their lungs inflated. So if they're already having a hard time exhaling and then you put positive pressure in their face, they're going to feel like they're suffocating because it's even harder for them to exhale now. A lot of your COPD and asthma patients won't tolerate CPAP very well. So um, it's really intended for this congestive heart failure pulmonary edema patients. Uh, prior to use of CPAP in the pre-hospital environment, a lot more patients were being nasotracheal intubated, tube up the nose into the lungs, and um, then put on ventilators. It was a very common process. So we don't use CPAP in any of these. Remember how I said before, facial trauma, put a tube up the nose, it go in, could go into their brain. Well, if there's facial trauma and a fracture, we put a pressure device on their face to push air in, you're gonna push air into their brain. So that's why we don't do it. Um, if they're respiratory arrest, re agonal respirations, we don't use CPAP, we use a BVM. We want to ventilate them. We have to give them the breaths. Closed head injuries are susceptible to increased intracranial pressure. CPAP, constant pressure in the face, is going to increase intracranial pressure. Um, pneumothorax, any kind of major chest trauma, the CPAP is just gonna make that that pneumothorax work. Now, I know it says that we're not supposed to do CPAP for cardiogenic shock, but yet I've been saying congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema,
heart attack. These are all things that cause cardiogenic shock. The reason is if we're pushing CPAP onto their face and we're putting pressure into their lungs, it's going to reduce blood return to their heart. That means lower cardiac output. That means lowering the blood pressure. So a, another way to say this is if the patient is hypotensive, we don't want to use CPAP. All right, they have to have an adequate blood pressure. Cardiogenic shock is a very late form of CHF or MI where their blood pressure is falling because their heart can't beat hard uh, fast enough. In the earlier stages, we will use CPAP to treat that pulmonary edema, but if their heart can't maintain adequate blood pressure, CPAP is not appropriate. Obviously, if the per person's vomiting, nauseated, you don't want CPAP because they'll vomit and aspirate immediately. All right, so uh, the generator is generally a little device that fits directly to the mask. That so it helps create your fill, uh, <clears throat> your um, pressure. Of course, you hook the mask up, you've got the circuit, the, court, the tubing, whatever design setup it is. It might be a thin oxygen tube. It might be a, a large corrugated vent tube. It, it doesn't really matter at all. One-way valves are common because the patient, I mean, that's what allows the air in, but then restricts its flow back out. Bacteria filters should go on the exhalation port. If the patient has pneumonia or tuberculosis or something like that, that bacteria filter will help it. Contrary to uh, what we tried to um, pretend for the last two years, bacteria filters do not block viral transmission, even with airborne viruses. Air viruses are so much smaller than a bacteria. You know, you're looking at a bacteria being like 250 nanometers and a virus being like five nanometers. So, um, they're, you know, that's a huge, huge difference in size between the two. Um, so uh, your, a lot of your viruses will not be uh, trapped with a bacterial filter. Will some? Probably. But it's not like a guarantee. All right, so how much pressure do we use with CPAP? Generally, as it says here, five to 10. I've seen re recommendations up to 15. Uh, below five, you're really not making a big enough difference. Um, above 15, you're starting to create a bigger uh, pressure differential and upset the blood pressure more than is beneficial. So it becomes, uh, while it's possible, it's like negatives are outweighing the positives. So in that five to 10 range is where we're typically gonna see our CPAP being effective. Um, your devices, there's so many different brands. Um, uh, so this one right here, this has a gauge and it sh as you can see in this picture uh, that gauge is going to give you the reading of, you, you can see that it goes 5 10 15 20 and up to 25 you're going to adjust your pressures with simply adjusting the oxygen liter per minute flow rate so the you know the line this o2 line here will connect to your oxygen tree on the regulator and then you'll see your pressure with every breath right there and then um, you'll just adjust the pressures by adjusting your uh, flow rate um, that's probably the most common kind this is this is another device this one has the ability to This one has the ability to connect directly to the um, to a pressure port, a regulator port, um, without having to use the Christmas tree, and then it leaves the Christmas tree available if you're trying to run a um, nebulizer as well. Uh, you can see the uh, pressure is going to be gauged right here, five, seven and a half, and ten, and then you'll adjust it by adjusting the oxygen flow rate right here. Um, so very similar they're all rather simul similar in their function this one your pressure is going oops or 
where where's a better picture of that device um that's a good picture of it. all right so what we have here is this device you're gonna um adjust your CPAP pressure it's going to be set at a set rate set flow there's the pulmonary that's the vent uh, the filter this gets connected to oxygen at a set rate and then you adjust your pressure right here by twisting this cap and setting what you want it at now when you do this this device is going to use a lot more oxygen because it's that constant pressure flow instead of um, the the adjustable type where you're adjusting your pressure by adjusting your oxygen flow. So there's just benefits to the different ones, but they all have a similar fundamental um, function. Now, some are gonna use a ventilator device like this. Um, that's an O2 event, or that's just a portable ventilator. And there are other devices, the other types of ventilators out there that do it as well. Um, one I've used a lot is ventilators, and um, the this lease picture again all right so this is the newton ventilator and you can um this is a patient circuit connects there and then you adjust your um peak pressures and your peep cpap pressures and then your rate so like this is a ventilator but you flip it to a zero rate and then adjust your peep and now you have cpap so some of our CPAPs out there are going to be operated by a ventilator or some form of device, uh, you know, some mechanical device. So lots of different options when it comes to CPAP. Um, all right. Um, let me, I need to uh, go meet somebody who just arrived. Give me a uh, second and I will be back. So don't really go anywhere, but uh, take a quick break. All right, so back to, like I pointed out, a lot of, there are some complications that can come from CPAP. It has a lot of benefits. However, if we are going to uh, use it, we may end up putting air in the stomach. We can also end up putting air in the stomach using just a standard BVM. We talked about that before. And then when that happens, we will have to decompress the stomach. Um, and the best way to do that is with a oral or nasogastric tube. Remember, when a person is in cardiac arrest, they don't have the ability to vomit actively because there's no muscle control, but they have the ability to vomit passively if we overinflate their stomach. Um, so, we want to reduce that risk by reducing the amount of air that's in their stomach. So we'll drop a tube, not a nasogastric or oral gastric tube to help um, re uh, relieve that pressure. Also, if you think about it this way, back to our model here, if um, we start to inflate the stomach with air here, that's more pressure on the diaphragm that per that reduces the amount of room that the um, diaphragm can um, So anyway, it, that it's more pressure against the diaphragm and prevents the diaphragm um, from being able to inflate the lungs. This is why you do when you're ventilating with the BVM, uh, whether they're tubed or if it's just a mask, you uh, uh, only give the breath until you see the chest start to move. So it's like a one second breath. You don't want to take, uh, you don't want big, long, or aggressive breaths. <clears throat> 
So there's your nasogastric tube technique. Um, we'll demonstrate that with the uh, mannequin later on. Oral gastric works the exact same. You're just inserting it into the stomach uh, through the mouth instead of through the nose. There, once your patient is intubated, there's no benefit one way or the other. If the patient has a gag reflex, the nasogastric method is going to be um, more tolerated by the patient. But if they don't have a gag reflex, the oral gastric method works just as fine. And typically that's what I end up doing is just dropping the OG tube um, instead of the NG tube. Anytime you have facial trauma, no NG tubes. We've kind of already pointed that out. So there's your NG tube or your OG tube method. All right. Um, All right, laryngectomy, this is for patients who have had their trachea removed or their larynx removed, and now the access into their trachea is through the open stoma. Sometimes we have to suction that. Soft suction catheter is preferred. You should not use the uh, Yonker, um, Yankauer uh, hard suction catheter with stomas because the risk of damaging the uh, trachea is increased. Um, very, very careful with the mucus plugs. Can you ventilate a patient with a stoma? Absolutely. Their trachea up here, their larynx has already been removed or messed up. There's a scar tissue. So now they have the stoma opening right here. Go ahead and uh, you. what you do is you'll, you, let's say it's an adult patient. You can take a pediatric or infant uh, BVM mask, put it over the tra the stoma, and then ventilate them with an adult sized BVM, um, and and that's all you have to do. You can ventilate it here. You don't ventilate with the mask over the mouth because that would ventilate uh, would leak out of here. We already know that their larynx and their trachea isn't working properly, so we don't ventilate here. We ventilate here. This will reduce the risk of gastric distension. You can also drop an ET tube through the stoma. Patient has a stoma, they need to be ventilated. Take your ET, like 70, 80, I don't care, whatever size is necessary, insert it in there. You don't wanna insert it really deep because your stoma is here. And remember, your carina, you have the sternal notch, right? Sternal notch is right here, the carina is right behind the sternal notch, and most stomas are right there. So once you've inserted that ET tube, you don't want it going really deep. I mean, it's just far enough to get the cuff into the trachea, and then you inflate the cuff, and you're good to go. That's all you need. And you can ventilate from that ET tube right there at the stoma. No intubation required, secured airway. Um, very functional option. If the pay, if you have trach tubes, like tracheostomy tubes on your truck, cool. If you don't, oh well, use the ET tube. Um, so that would be a trach tube, but you know, a regular ET tube would do the same thing. Um, most of the time when your patients have a stoma, when they have a trach tube of some sort and then start suddenly having issues with breathing, obstruction is your problem. You're going to, you, you've got some form of crud built up in there and that needs to be uh, removed. I mentioned the other day when suctioning a trach or whatever, oftentimes that mucus plug will get hardened, will get dry and hardened and you'll have to take like a 10 cc syringe of saline and flood it you know, push the whole thing down in there let it sit let it you know percolate through and uh loosen up that crud and then suction it out and then if it's still a bunch of crud in there do it again patients get a ton of mucus build up in those kind of talked about facial trauma a little bit the other day now i'm moving through this part because this is the stuff we covered the other day all the pieces and parts we'll go back to the lab side um on that in a little while what i'm trying or what my goal here this morning is to try to um just cover some various aspects of this whole uh process before we um, go back to lab all right um we covered all this all right so let's talk about confirmation we didn't talk too much about confirmation before showing you breaths per minute blah, blah, blah. all right so the best way to confirm placement of your et tube is to visualize the tube passing through the vocal cords um we saw the picture back here there's a picture of your vocal cords you want to see the tube pass through that that is a very um 
clear, very, uh, dis, you know, very trusted method of confirmation. Another method is to have a hand placed right here over the trachea, right at the larynx, when the ET tube is being passed through the trachea. And it doesn't have to be your hand. It could be somebody else's hand if they're holding it there. Um, you're you're doing the intubation they've got their hand there they can feel the tube pass through their fingers through that tracheal um the larynx and that's a great method of confirmation so those are some of your confirmation methods after that you want to auscultate we did talk about the auscultation we did talk about right main stem and things like that a little bit but what are some of the other ways we can do it um Uh, waveform capnography is the gold standard. Waveform is what we want to see. And the reason it should be waveform and not color metric is color metric can be fooled. If a patient, ha if you tube their esophagus and the patient has recently consumed carbonated beverages, beer, um, sodas, something like that, um, then they have co2 in their stomach carbonation is co2 so if the patient has a lot of co2 from the carbonation in their stomach and you tube their esophagus then as soon as you go put the color metric on there it will change color because co2 will be venting when you're drinking soda and you burp that burp is co2 being released that's where that gas is um so Carbon, so waveform or color metric capnography will be fooled by carbonation in the stomach. We don't want to see that happen. So that's why waveform is necessary. You give the breath and then you should see a very clear, defined wave, uh, um, entitled CO2 wave. That's what we're looking to see. So another way of doing esophageal detector devices. There's a couple different kinds. There's syringes and there's bulbs. This is a, a syringe right here. You put the tube in and then you attach this large syringe to it, pull like suction on a syringe. And we all know, and I'll show you later on the lab, when you pull on a syringe and its end is occluded, you get a lot of resistance. If there's no occlusion on the end, air moves freely in the syringe, right? So if the ET tube has entered the trachea and the trachea is a rigid tube, it won't collapse, you'll get good airflow. But if the ET tube has entered the esophagus, the esophagus is a flaccid tube and will collapse around the ET tube. So when you try to pull suction, esophagus collapses around it, you get resistance and you can't pull suction. So the, the EDD uh, syringe option, here's the bulb style. You put the bulb on the tube, you compress it. If um, it's in the trachea, it will immediately expand again. If it's in the esophagus, it will not expand or expand very, very slowly. And um, then a, a good way of confirming the placement of your tube. We talked about securing the other day, so I'm gonna move past that. Now let's talk a little about um, video laryngoscope i do not have a video laryngoscope immediately available today um i actually might later today and i'll if i so i'll show you call me old school call me unwilling to change you know say whatever mean thing you want to i get it like and, and, you know and i'm okay and i'll accept that Video laryngoscopes are incredible tools. They have a purpose, they have a place, but they are overrated in the pre-hospital environment. In, the, in, in a hospital, in the OR, where you have a patient who's been NPO for the last 24 hours, they've got nothing in their stomach, they will not vomit, they're not full of phlegm, they're not bleeding all over the place. A video laryngoscope is a excellent tool it makes visualizing the airway so much easier you can guarantee tube placement um you can easily see it past the vocal cords and there's some like the king lt and stuff like that or excuse me not the king lt the king vision that once you visualize the vocal cords 
it has a pathway that the ET tube slides down and then is placed directly into the trachea. It's like designed for that. It's incredible, very useful. However, we don't have that perfect, clean, prepared environment in pre-hospital. The majority of the patients you will intubate during your EMS career are going to have vomit, blood, or some other form of secretion in their esophagus, in their oral trachea, or it's in their trachea, in their oral pharynx, and they are a mess. And laryngoscopes, video laryngoscopes are awesome. Uh, let's see, the one on the, none of these is actually the glide scope. Um, the one here on the top left, that is the closest look to the glide scope design. Um, the one on the top right is the King Vision. I've used that one. That's the one that has the little pathway that you slide the ET tube down. Um, these are good tools. And um, what you got there, Megan? Is that Megan in Noonan? Yeah, so that's a form of video laryngoscope. Let me uh, pin this one so you guys can spotlight. So see what she's showing, turn it sideways. So that's one of the uh, video laryngoscope options. Is that one got the blade attached to it right now? I can't, I can't see for sure. Yes, all right, cool. Yeah, it's got the uh, easy remove uh, disposable blade. My department is getting a, something very similar to that. Um, I think it's just a different model of that brand. Um, all right, so video laryngoscopes are really cool. I, um, you know, one of the best features is they can record the intubation attempt. So when the question comes up later, well, did you actually get it into the esophagus? Well, here's the, I mean, into the trachea. Well, here's the recording. You can see it passing through the lines. It can be attached to your PCR, very useful in a um, documentation method. My big issue, with the laryngoscopes is they don't have windshield wipers. They have a little camera or a small uh, a fiber optic lens that runs down the laryngoscope and it's at the very end of, or towards the end of the blade. You can see it in all of these uh, devices so that you get a good view of the esophagus or of the trachea and the esophagus. If the patient has phlegm, blood or vomit, in their in their airway you get a little bit of any of those things on that blade and or i mean on that lens and you can't see anything now they're all like oh yeah they're made so that you can um they're anti-fog they don't fog. like look i'm not worried about it fogging okay my patient that i'm intubating is not breathing that's why i'm intubating them i'm not worried about fogging what i'm worried about is a chunk of vomit or a whole bunch of blood I can think of maybe two pre-hospital innovations that didn't have tons of crud in there that I had to deal with. Uh, you know, a very common uh, method of innovation is called the salad method, where when you insert the uh, ET tube, excuse me, you insert the laryngoscope, you insert a Yonker suction catheter down the esophagus right next to the laryngoscope and then flip it to the side. And then, so it's called salad suction assisted um, laryngoscope. In a, I don't remember what it is, uh, intubation, uh, salad, uh, you know, intubation device or something like that. Basically, there's suction in there at the same time, and it's constantly sucking the vomit out while you do the intubation attempt. The video laryngoscope, as soon as it gets smeared, you can't see anything. You would have to withdraw the laryngoscope, wipe off the lens, and then try again. That means you've made an attempt because Technically, anytime the laryngoscope passes through the teeth, that is an intubation attempt. So the old quick look, hey, oh, I'm just gonna go look and see what I've got before I try the attempt. That's technically an attempt. If you were to do that in a national registry testing scenario, that would count as your first of your three attempts to intubate. My department doesn't give us three attempts. We have one attempt. And so that's why I'm kind of not a fan of video laryngoscope because if it gets smeared, you can't see anything and you've lost your attempt. So they're really useful. 
they have great benefits um, but they have like all things limitations their technology they can fail um, all right nasal tracheal intubation talked about that a little bit the other day really don't see that a whole lot anymore CPAP has kind of done away with it um, and then RSI has also um, made it so we don't need to worry about it as much all right that's the trigger tube right there they're not showing it with the BAM device the BAM device really makes it way easier Moving past nasal trachea. All right, digital intubation. This means you have a patient who's unresponsive, who may have a head injury or some other thing. You don't have a laryngoscope for some reason. This is the part of the scenario I don't understand. Why, why, why do you not have a laryngoscope functioning? Didn't you check your truck? Anyway, you have... You don't have a laryngoscope, so you're sticking your booger hooks down the patient's throat to try to finger the ET tube into the trachea. You know, your fingers is the size of the ET tube. Like, you're really filling that mouth up, and you're trying to get them all the way back there. And girls, are you with me? Most guys don't know how to use their fingers that well. So... How are we going to find the the epiglottis and get that ET tube into the trachea? And we got all this stuff in there. Like, okay, sure, it's an accepted method if it's a very last ditch effort, but really, this should not be your um, attempt. Like, this should not be your plan. Oh well, you know, if that doesn't work, I'll just digitally animate them. I don't like sticking my fingers in patients' mouths. They have a tendency to bite even when they're unresponsive because the stimulation neural you know activity their jaw starts clenching and you know yeah so all right so some other methods this is showing you how to um hook your et tube um i prefer the um well i use my et tube like the top picture there with the hockey stick uh they call it open j in this way and i call it a hockey stick uh method that's my preferred method for any any intubation technique but yeah i mean this is on a cadaver who probably doesn't have teeth and you can see how little room there is in there to be manipulating things around so um yeah, I, I'm I'm not a fan of the uh, digital uh, innovation method. Now, um, trans illumination technique. This is another. This can be done with or without a, a laryngoscope. Um, if you're without the laryngoscope, I, I prefer this much more over, or I prefer this significantly more than I than the. Um, digital method it has an incredibly bright light at the tip of the stylet and so when you insert it into the trachea you'll get a very defined glow a uh, very tight glow if it's in the esophagus their whole neck is just kind of glowing a little bit like a dull glow but if it gets into the trachea it's a very clear circle a very clear dot of light and then you you know you're in the trachea so uh it has a i think it's a great place uh or a great method i don't see it a whole lot i haven't seen it available very frequently huh Um, so anyway, uh, tra transillumination, eh, you know, it's a good technique. I, I wish we had the equipment for it, but that's the issue. You have to have an, have to have the equ equipment to do it. Um, I mean, really, you, you, you could read these things, the details. I don't have the lighted stylet, so I'm not going to be able to.
straight translumination, but it, it, it's pretty straightforward. Once you get the concept of intubation, these other methods are not that big. All right, retrograde intubation. Again, why this is recommended in the pre-hospital environment, I don't really know. We rarely have the application for it. We, we almost never have the equipment for it. Oddly enough, there was a case in the state of Maryland a few years ago where a paramedic performed transillumination, or excuse me, uh, retrograde um, intubation and got uh, called out on the carpet because it's not in the scope of practice for Maryland paramedics. He was successful with it. He had been taught, trained how to do it at a previous state where it was within um, protocol and scope of practice. Maryland had a different protocol, so he went, got in big trouble. The benefit here is when the patient has significant tracheal swelling, or a tracheal, laryngeal swelling, you, um, you can use this to pass through, but you're gonna destroy the patient's vocal cords using this method when if they have laryngeal swelling. So the idea is you insert a needle into the cricothyroid membrane, all right, just like you're doing a needle crike. And then instead of ventilating the patient through that needle, which I get, you, you, it's not an effective way, they insert a guide wire into the um, trachea through that needle, and then that wire comes back up into the back of their mouth. Then you see the wire in the mouth, you fish it out, you pull it up through, you pull the needle out of the um, cricoid membrane, and now they have a wire that went in their neck and came out their mouth. You slide the ET tube down that wire, and in just like we're gonna, sh I'll show you later with the bougie, you're sliding the ET tube down the wire into the trachea, and then you pull the wire out and slide the, uh, continue to advance the ET tube to the tr uh, further into the trachea. That if you're doing this, it's because you don't have a laryngoscope or you're not able to force the ET tube through um, the trachea keeps um, being deflected by laryngeal swelling. So you're really risking tearing up the larynx um, using this method. Does it work? Yes. But if you're gonna go for a needle crike, I would rather do, um, or if you're inserting the needle into the crico memory, just ventilate through that. All right, just you're using a big needle, um, just ventilate through that. Now, personally, I think the surgical crike is the better plan. I think it's a much better option than a retrograde intubation. We don't have that as street medics in Georgia, but flight medics do. So it, it is an option that exists for your airway burn patients and uh, laryngeal edema patients. So. This is another one of those that I just kind of like sit here and scratch my head. You guys can practice this on Friday, mess around with it if you want. It's a really difficult method. And to me, it's like, why? Why are you in a situation where you're attempting to intubate a patient? And I just noticed, I've never noticed that before. He's holding that laryngoscope backwards and he's trying to insert the tube on the wrong side of the laryngoscope blade. So the, like he doesn't even have a good view. Like that's a terrible picture demonstration of how to do face-to-face -face intubation. Sometimes it's referred to as the tomahawk method. People have never died because of a failure to intubate. They die because of a failure to ventilate. And what that means is there's more than one way to get air into their esoph into their trachea. It doesn't have to be through an ET tube. Drop an NPA, drop an OPA, bag mask, bag mask ventilation, needle crike, surgical crike. There's a lot of other options. So if you cannot put yourself into a position to do a normal uh, direct visualization tracheal or a laryngeal tracheal intubation, please don't risk the intubation attempt. This is it. This method face to face is so full of risks of esophageal intubation that and if you mistakenly do that and you start ventilating their stomach and not their lungs, you're going to create a whole lot of hypoxic injury and a lot of damage. So 
really, really hesitant to you know do these things. You know, five years from now, when you've done a bunch of cadaver labs, you've done a bunch of field innovations, you're starting to become extremely familiar with your anatomy and you know how, what you're doing, sure, maybe you can start dabbling with this kind of stuff. But mostly, this is just a method for people to brag about and it probably didn't work in the first place. Um, and they're trying to compensate for something. So it's kind of like the paramedic equivalent of putting 40 inch tires and a 12 inch lift on your uh, pickup truck what, that you drive around the city hey it, it, it really isn't uh benefiting anyone all right so what does a failed innovation mean failed innovation means you have not been able to establish an et tube a patent et tube patent et tube with three attempts or while making your attempt even on your first attempt the patient desaturated okay if their oxygen saturations are dropping below 90 some places will say 85 but man when you get down to 85 you're dropping like a rock at that point so um if your sats are getting below 90 that's a desat and that's risking significant hypoxic injury some would argue that that's not really a fail because the patient wasn't breathing already, their O2 sat had already desatted, but the idea is you can ventilate them with a BVM and maintain sats. So if you aren't doing that and you're causing them to hy become hypoxic again, that's the failed innovation. That's the screw up that you created and you could have avoided by simply using the BVM or another form of airway control. Nobody died because you didn't innovate them. They died because you didn't ventilate them. Well, is innovation a really effective way to ventilate them? Yeah, it's great. However, you might want to um, make sure that they're still ventilating while you're trying to do your attempt. All right, <clears throat> tracheal bronchial suctioning. This is easier to explain in demonstration than it is in um, by, uh, discussion. So field extubation, something happened that caused you to feel that the patient needed to be intubated, okay? The circumstances in which that patient, that, that concern, that, that event is reversed and unavoidable again or um won't happen won't be repeated are extremely low i'm not a fan of field extubation can you do it yes are there times and places where you might do it yes but in general something caused you to need to intubate that patient chances of that happening again are high just because your patient is starting to wake up, they're starting to buck the tube, they're starting to gag a little bit, doesn't mean we need to in a, um, extubate them. You have a good tube, that's a secure airway, extubating them increases the risk of vomiting, which increases risk of aspiration, uh, tracheal spasms or laryngeal spasms, tracheal damage, all of that can make it harder for them to be ventilated and make it harder to re-intubate. Basically, you should never extubate a patient unless you're guaranteed to be able to successfully re-intubate them. So for that reason, if my patient is showing signs of mental status and bucking the tube and not wanting to be intubated, I'm going to sedate them. I have protocols for that. I can drop some Versed, snow them out a little bit, get rid of that whole gag reflex and, ga and trying to buck the tube. I would rather do that than risk messing up their airway or um, losing their airway by extubating them and then things going south. Not a big fan of extubation. However, it might happen. You might have to do it. So how do we do it? Well, you explain the, what you're gonna do to the patient. If you cannot clearly explain to the patient and they can clearly understand what it is you're saying, you don't need to be doing it. Snow the patient out and keep on going to the hospital, all right? Then you wanna have them sit up, lean forward. If the patient can't sit up and lean forward and maintain that posture, you don't need to be extubating them, all right? And then you get suction ready, you get a vent or a, a, a basin, a vomit basin ready. Um, you deflate the cuff, put the suction in their mouth, 
and then you have them exhale as you um, smoothly, but not rapidly, um, smoothly withdraw the ET tube. So sit up, lean forward, hold the basin, put suction in their mouth, deflate the ET tube cuff, and then have them exhale as you withdraw the ET tube. That's how you um, uh, extubate them. If you can't make all that happen, just give them Versed, knock them out, keep them asleep, and go on to the hospital. So what are medications that we might be able to use to prevent aspiration and maintain um, or excuse me, uh, facilitate airway control. Sedatives, I just mentioned it. Versed's a good one. Um, ketamine is an excellent option. Um, some uh, Haldol and Geodon are not good options. Do not consider those uh, sedatives. Uh, Ativan can work. Etomidate is really good, but it only lasts about eight minutes. Um, a lot of places don't carry it. So you can use Etomidate, um, but again, you're gonna have to follow it up with Versed. Versed's probably one of your better options. Um, a lot of places don't carry Ativan because it has to be refrigerated or expires really quick. Valium, in my opinion, has never been powerful enough. Uh, you have to give such a high dose of it. It's just, it's, you're better off to use Versed. Um, in the hospital environment, propofol is a very common long-term sedative. We don't see that in the pre-hospital environment very often. All right, so. I already talked about, you know, um, Ativan and Versed. Well, diazepam is Valium. Um, excuse me. So Valium and Versed. Uh, if you give too much benzodiazepines like uh, Versed, you could do a... Um, re you can reverse it with the flunmazenil, um, but just ventilate them. That's your big concern there. Um, just just keep their airway you know control their airway and ventilations you'll be all right uh, again ketamine already mentioned that so fentanyl morphine yeah they're they have their benefits here and sometimes they're better used in combination with like verset so like you're going to do um 100 of fentanyl and 10 of versed uh to keep the patient um sedated um for you know you'll do uh five of morphine and five of versed and keep them out uh, and that can be very useful um the benefit of using pain is a person's level of sedation is going to be um, significantly affected by their level of stimulation. If pain is causing neural stimulation, you're going to need to kick the pain out before your sedation is going to be effective. So that's a benefit of using the narcotic, uh, the opiate narcotic um, combina combined with the sedative like the benzo. So you want to re remove pain from the equation and then your sedatives are going to be more effective. So, uh, I already mentioned Atomidate, really great medication. It's just short acting. All right, so neuromuscular blocking agents. These are paralytics. This is what will stop your muscles from functioning. And the goal here is to stop all the skeletal muscles from working. So the diaphragm won't work, the stomach won't work, the um, larynx won't work. These are all voluntary muscles that you, that you will paralyze. That means as soon as you've given it to the patient, they can't breathe. You have to breathe for them. You're taking a patient who is breathing or has muscle function and completely removing it. This is a huge liability on your part as a, as a healthcare provider. This is why it's so carefully regulated because you took a patient who's breathing and you removed that ability to breathe. You took a patient who could control their airway to some degree and you removed that ability to do so. Electively, in the OR, it's great. In the pre-hospital environment, it really should be limited to patients who are in um, a significant risk of airway compromise where they might have a little gag reflex or maybe they have a clenched jaw but they are not protecting their airway fully and so they're still at risk of aspiration 
So you're going to sed uh, sedate them and paralyze them and take away their airway controls so that you can intubate them. Um, one of the things you want to think about here is um, it has absolutely no effect on their um, level of consciousness. And this is one of the reasons we lost the privilege of doing it on a regular basis is paramedics were misusing it. They were, oh, the patient's drunk. They're already unconscious or whatever. Well, I'm sure that you've experienced being intoxicated at some point in your life. And you probably remember that, yeah, while you were really drunk and don't have a lot of re recollection of what happened during that time, when you were drunk, you were aware of what was going on. So these patients who were intoxicated, instead of sedating them, the providers were pushing paralytics, completely removing their ability to move. So they're laying there completely paralyzed and unable to breathe and conscious and aware of what was going on around them. And um, I don't know if you've ever watched uh, a lot of Russell Crowe, uh, no, Gerard Butler movies, uh, Law Abiding Citizen. He uses this technique. He uses paralytics in that movie as a form of torture. Um, it's torture. It is inhumane to paralyze a person while they're still conscious. Um, so they have to be sedated first. Then, once you've removed the ability for them to get, maintain that airway, there is no if we can get the int intubation. You will get the intubation. So, when you're looking at the scenario and you're like, man, this is going to be a difficult intubation. There's too much trauma. There's too much of whatever. That might not be the right time for you to paralyze someone because you've removed their ability to protect that airway. And now you're going to risk on a maybe I'll tube them maybe it will be effective no 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 there will there is no maybe it is must you must get that tube um because you're uh essentially killing them or causing incredible amounts of harm um as um if you've missed it if you fail to get that tube so here's some of your different uh uh, paralytic succacetacholine it's a pretty low do or it's a fairly common one but it's a very short acting um it lasts about eight minutes it was used uh quite frequently for that reason um the paral paralysis wears off pretty quick the problem with succacetacholine is it's depolarizing it causes all their muscles to contract when um it's given and so if you give this electively like in surgery the patient will feel like they had a full body workout the next day they will be very uncomfortable that's why it's lost a little of its um uh, Luster, people don't like it as much. Rocuronium, uh, ven vecuronium, uh, pancuronium, those are non-depolarizing. These will not cause fasciculations. These do not cause muscle contraction. Um, but as you can see here, 45 to 60 minutes, um, uh, 30 to 60 minutes, I think rocuronium can be upwards of uh, 90 minutes of function. So these can be a really long-acting para paralytics um some would say well don't use them if you don't know if you'll get it no you shouldn't be using a paralytic if you don't know if you can get the tube or not like there there is no question there there is no try only so. paralytics uh i'm not going to talk doses i'm not going to talk a lot of details on them because you don't have those available at this time you might somewhere else in the world and you may if you go to critical care school but right now it's not a big deal so we're not going to focus a whole lot on paralytics at this time um we'll talk about rsi later on but honestly there's nothing rapid about rsi it is the same as a regular intubation you just sedated them and paralyzed them first um but again that's better handled in the um face-to-face -face environment um so all right this gets into alternative airway controls um your most of you are a's some of you are b's read up on these we don't see a whole lot of um blind insertion airways uh like kings excuse me we don't see a lot of kings anymore some places still use them really easy to use 
LMAs, laryngeal mask airways, these are very common in the OR. However, they're not considered to be secure enough in the pre-hospital environment or too, move, too much movement, they dislodge too easily. They have a large inflatable uh, cuff. I'll be bringing some out later to show you so you see what I'm talking about. There you can see the way that it fits into the trachea. Excuse me, it fits around the opening of the trachea, the glottic opening and then you inflate it. Um, so there you go, that's the LMA, kind of looks like something else. A few different styles of LMA, I believe it is this one on the top. One of these has the ability to introduce the ET tube through it, so once you've established the LMA, you can uh, insert a ET tube and get a secure airway. All right, this is the eye gel, something that came out of England, and as most of us will agree, there's not much good comes out of England. Um, sorry if you're from there, but uh, I'm not a fan. I'll just be blunt. I don't work for any of these companies. This is the blind insertion airway my department utilizes. I don't like it, and I avoid it at all costs. I will use an OPA before I use this. Um, the reason is I don't believe it seals adequately, and so you're still inflating the stomach. You're still risking aspiration. Um, it's supposed to adhere to the side of the throat, but in order to get it placed, you have to cover it with a water-based lubricant, which means it won't adhere to the side of the throat anymore. Or if they do vomit or have any form of blood in there, it's not going to adhere. And so it's not, it's just not a good tool. In the OR, it's a great tool. Controlled, careful, quiet environment. In the pre-hospital environment, if the LMA that inflates to create its seal isn't good enough, I don't understand why anyone thinks this is good enough. I think this is one of those fad bandwagons that everybody jumped on and nobody put enough effort into finding out if it really worked and now we're stuck with a piece of junk that makes us think we're doing our job when we're really not. And I'm being really honest here. Um, if your department utilizes these, then be familiar with how to use them and you and use them but you can be pretty much just as effective um with a bvm people are oh you can use this to get an end title well yes but you can get an end title on a bvm if you use a two-person bvm one person's holding the mask seal and the other person's then squeezing the bag you can main you can monitor end titles with that you do not need an eye gel, a king, a combi tube, or an ET tube to um, get an end title on a patient. Heck, I mean, we're getting end titles on patients with um, nasal cannulas. So again, shows you how the, the eye gel fits. It's got less size options. It doesn't inflate. Um, I've used them many times. A a trying to get it to place properly is very difficult. You're, it's just gonna, pull out really easy, it's gonna to go too deep, uh, which then means you've missed the glottic opening and you're now just ventilating the stomach. Or you're too shallow and you're not getting it into the glottic opening and it's just escaping through the nasal passages. I just don't think it's a useful pre-hospital tool. This is the Cobra. I've seen these on uh, in training rooms, but I've never used them in the field. They work just like the King um, or the LMA. They're very, very similar, very easy to um, insert. Nothing fancy there. Um, Combi tubes, fortunately, we don't see these much anymore. They have a purpose, they had a place, but they, um, fortunately, technology has moved us past them. Some places might still use them, and that's okay, they worked, um, but they make a mess. The one thing they should have done was uh, package them with a cap, so once you've placed it and you, um, you found which port you're ventilating through, um, if that's working, they should have come with a cap that goes over the other one because the few times that I've worked at places that had them, every time you defibrillated, the patient vomit squirted out the other tube and like violently, like we'd get to the hospital and there's vomit all over the ceiling dripping on us because 
it would vent out. And we, we tried sealing it, we tried wrapping it with tape, we tried bending it over, and I, it would still squirt vomit. It was, it was disgusting. So, not a, f has its place, has its um, issues. Um, all right, Crike Airways, not gonna get into these right now. We, I'll show you those in a um, vision or uh, in the lab setting so that you can get a better handle on how that works. All right, so that is most that uh, other than you do need to read the book portion of the Crike, uh, the any type of Crike Airways, but they're easier for me to show you than they are for you to explain you're gonna that more so what we're gonna do now is we'll break for lunch uh, we're gonna take an hour so plan to be back at 1250 and uh, have all your equipment out have it ready uh, please take time during lunch to be practicing as well and uh, we'll be going over all that kind of stuff um, after lunch and it's basically gonna be labs after that all right somebody texted me added let's see uh, Oh, that's all right. All right, so. Sure. All right, I'm gonna record. So I'll demonstrate it again because um, I wasn't recording. So we'll demonstrate it again real quick. All right. So I have my hold the camera right here. I have my suction ready to go. My a laryngoscope's ready to go. I'm gonna use the bougie for this for this technique. So bougie's right here. He's found the trachea. I open the airway. I put my fingers on top of his trachea. Find it. Position. All right, hold it right there. Don't move. Insert the bougie into the airway. Now that I'm in the trachea, he can let go and then grab my ET tube and we can advance the ET tube as such. So, um, and then we'll advance the ET tube down, yep, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's how you can do ELM, external laryngeal manipulation. Um, another term, okay. Relax, relax, relax. Hold your head this way. <laughs> Trying to hang your head off. What? Right? He's dead. So you can see the trachea. Make sure that the camera here. I mean your hands right. get right. So we can see the trachea. Another way to say it is back, up, and right, or burp, backward, upward, rightward pressure. You can see how I'm moving his trachea all over the place. It doesn't matter if it's which direction it is, it's a term to help you think where which do you need to move? Do you need to push it back? Do you need to push it up? Do you need to push it left? Do you need to push it right? But you can see how his trachea moves all over the place at, um, with that easy manipulation. So Selex maneuver, we don't recommend it, but BURP or ELM, two names for the same thing. This, that's what we recommend. Now, Bryce. Yep. No, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. Stay in okay. position. All right. So scooch down uh, towards the. There you go. Bryce, stay right here. Right here. Mm -hmm. All right. Bryce. See, we got it. Back up a little, and I want a view of the side this way. All right. So you can see his throat here. We know that his mouth is here. We know that the. Oral pharynx is this way, and we know that the trachea, the glottic opening goes this way. And when I rotate his head, the kid, so I might need to pad under the shoulders in order to do it, but that starts to, well, now he's possessed. Um, so now we just, now we're doing an exorcist. It gets a little bit tricky. So an easy alternative, relax, Conlon, all right? I'll pop your head off. <laughs> makes it a lot easier. So when I grab him under the arms and I slide him off the edge of the stretcher, see now his head hangs lower. Now this can actually create, I'm on my hand, okay? This can actually create too much pressure in the airway here. 
So I will lift somewhat, but see how much further I can rotate that head? So now we know that the oral, the, the uh, mouth is this way, the oral pharynx is this way, and the glottic open is this way. And we've gotten these lined up much better. So Conlon, open your mouth for me and say ah. Uh, All right, so so that we need something that can blot out the light because it's kind of like. All right, so what we're gonna do ah, now? No. All right, no, 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 I'm not putting this in your mouth, okay? But I'm using it as a light, Bryce. I'm gonna need you to bring the camera right here, basically where my nose is, to look into his mouth. All right, so open your mouth. Come out, say ah, ah. Uh -huh. All right, open your mouth. <laughs> yeah, I this right. Say ah. Uh, Bring your tongue. Uh, Say ah. All right. So now there we go. See the back of his throat. Swallow a little bit. Say ah. Uh, all right. So uh, see how we have a better view in there versus now. Let's slide in that way. Slide up onto the stretcher. All right. Now, looking up this way, not getting quite the angle of view, seeing a lot more of the epiglottis back there. Or not the epiglottis, the uvula, say ah. So you can see the difference there. All right, everybody see that? See what I'm talking about there? Conlon. So there we go. Yeah, we had a good, we had a good look at it once. All right, now, Against the wall. Oh boy. Alright. I'm going to relax for a minute. Now I'm not going to put his hand on you. Alright, so what I want to show you is um, I'm gonna we're going to do the melon potty. Alright, we're going to show you what the melon potty would be. So I would say, alright, sir, uh, stand up straight, open your mouth wide, stick your tongue out, and say, ah. Uh... So, so that you can see in his mouth somewhat. Yeah. Right, say yeah. Say ah. Uh, so what would we call that? What would we call this melon potty right there? How would you grade that? Uh, let's look again. So say ah. Uh, see how much of the posterior pharynx we can see? We can see the entire posterior pharynx behind, below the uvula. That makes it a one. If all we could see, if we could see the posterior pharynx, but um, only the tip of the uvula, not below it, that would be a two. A three would only see the base of the uvula, and a four would see no uvula whatsoever. We'd be looking at the top of his mouth. So um, that's... One is good, four is bad. Yes, yes. So that's how we do the melon potty. All right, um, so I was going to use a different piece of equipment and show you guys how that works, but it's uh, I don't have that. You don't need to hold this. No. And all right, let me. Just, you need me to hold it. Gotcha. So actually, yeah, hold the camera. Yeah. Thanks. All right. So, um, so we kind of saw a little bit there of how pulling the patient's head off the end of the stretcher can help. Um, I pointed out the other day. Now, off the stretcher. Do I just sit here? Yeah, just wait. Uh, and then lay down on the floor right here. Now, Conlon's small. There's no reason I wouldn't be able to innovate Conlon by myself, um, you know, just manipulating his airway. But let's say he's on the floor. Let's say he um, weighs 300 pounds and so he's older. I need to innovate him. So what I would have my partner do is come down like this, grabbing his arms like so, and I would, now you're dead, okay? You're <laughs> unconscious, so go completely limp. Okay, so I'm holding his arms and pulls up like that, and you can see how the same effect is created with his head hanging like that. All right, it's like his airway is open. Yep, so that's another way to uh, 
intubate and uh, properly line up the airway. In my opinion, the best way to intubate a patient is to be in the back of the ambulance with the patient on the stretcher. We're gonna lower the stretcher down. Come on, come over here. We're gonna lower the stretcher down real quick. Uh, do you need me to come and help? No, just on the ground. Okay. You're gonna grab the uh, big yellow handle right there. Right us. Mm -hmm. Five hours later. So, stretcher. Let's come over here. Yep. Side. The stretcher is all the way on the floor, just like you would see in the ambulance. Now we might be used to seeing the airway chair sitting, kind of. We call it the captain's chair or the airway chair, something like this. Kind of sitting over here to the side a little bit. Depends on the positioning of your ambulance. Sometimes it's right. Uh, this way, but if I'm trying to go in for an intubation here, even if I, even if I bring him to the edge of the stretcher, and I'm, he's hanging like this, I'm still looking down. Okay, I'm still looking down onto his throat. I'm not going to get a good view in this direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get on the floor, whether that's Indian style or whatever is necessary. Or safe. And then I'm going to view this way. And now, instead of looking down on his face, I'm looking into his body this way. And so I'll innovate in this method, like so. Okay, is that you see the difference there? My head is down lower, and I'm looking into his lungs. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be safe? Oh, yeah. So, all right, so do we have any questions so far? There's no time to say what he said. Can you make holding this or? Uh, you can set it on the table for now. Okay, it's going to be facing. Facing the clock. Where is it? Oh. I can't get under these all the tubes. On camera. I can't think of it. What? To take you to. I can't run into this. I told you to pack clothes. Wait, wait. Alright, um... I can't run. I'd rather not. Alright, hang on a minute. I'm going to pause all this.